the courage to be disliked. I'm not talking about having the courage to always deal with hate comments or trolls or to be blindly optimistic. I'm talking about the Japanese best-selling book selling over 6 million copies around the globe, the book called The Courage to Be Disliked. This book was really an eye-opener for me, and now I finally understood why this book was such a smash hit. But to be honest, there were a lot of things I didn't really know before reading this book. I read this book in Japanese, but the subtitle said, Alfred Adler's Lesson. I thought this was just a summary of Alfred Adler's theories who was an Austrian psychologist in the early 20th century. But this book is actually co-written by a Japanese counselor, Ichiro Kishimi, and author Fumitake Koga. 2 million copies are sold in Japan, but 4 million copies are sold around the world. Just by this data, you can imagine this is not a normal book. But you might be wondering, who in the world is Alfred Adler? Alfred Adler is known as one of the three greatest psychologists of all time. But wait a second, when we think of famous psychologists, we might only know Carl Jung and Siegmund Freud. In fact, there's a third and that's Alfred Adler. He has the third spot. The interesting thing is that Adler's theory has the most in common for people living in the modern world to adapt to become happy. And this was perfectly summarized by the two Japanese authors. They blended Greek philosophy to it and that's one of the reasons why this book became a worldwide bestseller. They were able to give Adler's theory a whole new taste so that's easy for us to understand. How the story goes is quite unique. When you hear of psychology or philosophy, you think of extremely difficult terms and sentences, right? This book is written in a way that even a child could understand. It's written in a dialogue form. A mentor who is a philosopher teaching Adler's theory to a boy apprentice. The amazing part of this dialogue that I like is whenever we try to read a hardcore book on philosophy, we always get question marks in our head. We think of, is that really true? I don't understand this. This is BS and it doesn't make sense. Give me a break, this won't work in the real world. These kind of questions and frustrations pop up when reading frequently. But in this book, the boy apprentice raises all our questions for us. He sometimes says childish questions which you can fully resonate with, but as you read forward, you start getting more knowledge. Eventually, you start being able to think like the mentor, which is quite amazing because it's written in a way so that we can all grow together. So let's dive into the content. The title of the book is called The Courage to Be Disliked, but it actually teaches the mindset on how to live a happy life. You might think this is such a big theme, but in a nutshell, there are only three main points. Just these three points is what the authors are trying to teach us. One, people can change. I know, I know, you might think this can't be true, right? Two, the world is simple. Yes, I know, you're thinking the world is too complicated. Three, everyone can be happy. Give me a break, right? But before you click off, hear me out. You and I think only a few percent on this earth can be happy. Am I correct? I mean, we all think people are suspicious when someone says everyone can be happy. We think they're a bunch of phonies. I assume that's what you're thinking. That all these three points are too easy to be real. But think about it backwards. 1. People can change. People can't change. 2. The world is simple. The world is too complicated. 3. Everyone can be happy. Everyone can't be happy. If you literally say this, even though I know we all have this kind of thoughts inside us, but that's such a pessimistic thought and makes you feel depressed, right? You start feeling like a zombie that I can't be happy in this world. But again, we do have these thoughts inside us like, I'm not talented, I'm not rich or charismatic. I'm not beautiful or smart enough. In the world of capitalism, where competition means everything, there is no way everyone can be happy. Aren't you thinking the same? When you hear these three beautiful points, there is always a doubt inside you that it's too simple to be true. But I bet there's a piece inside you that you wish this could be true. And that's what makes this book so exciting to keep on reading. 1. People can change. Let's tackle this one first. In the book, the mentor says, trauma doesn't exist. Well, well, hold on a second. There is trauma, right? I was bullied when I was in junior high school. I got ditched by my girlfriend, whatever. But I bet you there are people out there who had serious traumas in life. But this mentor denies this. He says trauma doesn't exist. And that's the reason why humans can change. Siegmund Freud's theory is the opposite saying, trauma exists and that's why humans can't change. Due to the past, the present exists. Cause and effect. 
For example, if someone had a terrible relationship with their parents, that's what created who they are now. We hear this a lot, right? If someone was sexually abused, they can't believe in men anymore. That's exactly what Freud says. The past events determine who you are now. Due to the past, the present exists. This is understandable, right? But Adler denies this theory. He says, does that theory make anyone happy? Cool, right? For example, when you catch a cold and go to the doctor and that doctor says, you've caught a cold because you got a virus in your throat a day ago. You could go home now. No, no, we need solutions, not reasons, right? That's what Adler is saying. Just because you know the reason why you caught a cold, that doesn't help you get out of it, right? Adler says this theory is completely wrong. He says there is no such thing as a trauma. And you're just using a trauma as an excuse. Holy smoke, what does this mean? He's saying that you just want to be where you are now, blaming on the past. A girl asks Adler that she has a problem getting nervous and her face turning red. And when Adler asks the girl, what do you want to do if you didn't get nervous? The girl says, if my face doesn't always turn red, I want to ask a boy to go out on a date with me. Then Adler said to her, I can't help your face turning red because you're trying to use the reason of being nervous to stay where you are. You are using it to justify yourself to not ask the boy to go out with you. Think about this. If the girl didn't get nervous and was able to ask the boy to go out on a date with her, there is still a risk that the boy will say no, right? That's fear and that's what the girl was running away from. If someone wants to be a musician and his strict father tells him he must be a doctor, he might study hard passing the exams and eventually become a doctor. But he will keep on whining saying, I had to follow my father's wish to become a doctor. I really wanted to be a musician. Based on Adler's theory, he would say, aren't you blaming your circumstances on your father? Aren't you just afraid of trying to become a musician but ending up not being famous? Aren't you using that as an excuse to justify the past of not becoming what you wanted? Aren't you afraid of admitting that you just ran away from your dream? Doesn't this hit you hard? It did for me. It's really rock and roll. He says all of us humans use trauma or anger or inferiority as an excuse. Let me explain. Anger. The mentor asks the boy. If a waitress spills a cup of coffee on you at the restaurant, you might get completely pissed off and start yelling at the waitress. Like, what the hell are you doing? You got to pay for the laundry. But the mentor would say, are you telling me that anger is uncontrollable? That you can't control your emotions? The boy says, I know getting angry is not a good thing, but I can't control it. The mentor then says, if you had a knife, would you stab the waitress? What? The boy says, of course, I don't think I would have done that. Why? It's too extreme. The mentor says, look, you can't control your emotions. There is a lot of similar cases out there, right? When you're having an argument with your spouse yelling at each other and when the next door neighbor rings the bell, you open the door and you try to act normal, right? It means you can't control your emotions. We can't control our behavior depending on who we oppose. If the person who spilled the coffee on you was the most handsome or beautiful person on earth, would you still get angry? If the person was Andre the Giant, will you get angry? Of course not. We can control our emotions. That's why Adler's theory is saying that we are just using our trauma, anger, and inferiority as an excuse. They are not the root cause. But the boy yells at the mentor. Does that mean I'm not mentally tough or weak? Are you saying that? That I'm not tough enough and there's no future for me at all? The mentor says no. And that's why the most important thing is to have the courage to change. Adler's theory is to not discourage people saying that this is the cause and you can't change the future. It encourages you that you can change yourself and the future as well. Don't you have the same kind of experience? Aren't you using other people's something as an excuse for you to stay on the same spot? We all do, right? You might say, I hate my job and I want to change it. But you come up with creative excuses like I'm too old. If I quit, my colleagues will suffer. I have a family and I can't take risk. You're making up those excuses in your head to keep where you are. At this point, I really thought this book rocks, but what was more interesting is what the mentor teaches the boy next. Two, the world is simple. Why? The mentor says most of the problems aren't your issue. And that's why the world is simple. What does this mean? And here comes the main dish. All the problems are made from human relationships. Literally all the problems. Really? 
wait a minute, there should be many problems out there, right? Financial problems, health problems, jobs, coronavirus, etc. The world is full of complexity, right? The mentor says no to this. All the problems are human relationships. If we get this under control, everything will work fine. The boy asks, what about money? The mentor says, what about money? Whether you have money or not, you're always comparing with someone else. You want to have more money, but compared to who? If someone wants a higher salary, from whom? And compared to who? Money has no value if it's not used with another human being. It's just a piece of paper which we exchange. And the three important elements of life is having a job, friends, and love. All of this is built on human relationship. People who have difficulties with their boss or colleagues at the office. People who struggle making friends at school. People who have a heartbreak with their lovers. The mentor says the most important starting point is to separate issues. Separate your problem and other people's problems. To separate things depending on who it impacts in the end as a result. For example, there are many mothers saying to their kids to study hard. The mentor would say you don't have to do that. Who will in the end suffer if the kid doesn't study hard? It's the kid. The mother doesn't need to intervene on the child's life. To just focus on your own life. But the boy would say, isn't that lonely? That I'm doing this job because my parents told me to give up on my dreams. The mentor says, you weren't able to separate your issue and your parents' issues clearly. And that makes you want to be a good boy and be praised by your parents. There are three prohibited rules that you must not do in Adler's theory. 1. To want to be praised. Now we're getting closer to the title of the courage to be disliked. Adler's theory denies seeking for approval from others. Trying to seek for approval and trying to be praised and get applause by people is what our education has been done for centuries, right? Great job, amazing performance. And if you don't do something right, you're told you're not allowed to because you didn't do this and that. You didn't put enough effort to win the prize. This kind of education style is called the carrot or the stick. The mentor says this is the soil of building mindsets that people won't do anything unless they're rewarded or praised. But the boy argues if someone is sweeping the streets on the block for two years, he would feel happy if someone would say, thank you for cleaning up every day. But what if no one says that? He would quit immediately without any recognition. If everyone living on that block ignores that person sweeping the streets, he would quit his job. Then the mentor would say, Are you saying that if you were that man, you would quit? Are you saying that you would decide whether you would quit or not depends on what other people say to you? If they praise you or say good things about you, you will keep on doing the job. And if not, you will quit. If that's the case, you're making other people around you decide what you should do in life. Another example, if your father asks you to quit your job, will you quit your job? If someone tells you to give up on your dream, will you? The mentor would say, you're not a free man. As long as someone else is deciding what actions you should take in life, you're not free at all. That's why you don't need to seek for other people's approval. And the second thing not to do is this. Don't praise. This is quite new, right? Don't praise. Based on Adler's theory, praising someone is an action that a person who has a higher ability does to someone lower than him. If you're leading a team and you say to your teammate, good job, that subconsciously creates a relationship that you are higher. Think about it, you will never say good job to your superior, right? Praising is something that someone who is higher does to someone lower. Then what should we do? The mentor says don't seek for praise and don't praise others. The reason why is because it creates a vertical relationship. Then what should you say when your teammate or your kid did a good job? You say thank you. You don't praise them, you show gratitude to them. Thank you for doing the job. Once you switch from praising to gratitude, you'll get free from the vertical relationship of trying to get more approval or praising someone to do something for you. Only when you stop living in the comparing world, seeking for approval on who has more or less. Only when you start living in the world of respecting each other and feeling grateful of one another. That's when you will have the courage to be disliked. But the boy says nobody wants to be disliked. The mentor says, of course, but can you control or what other people will feel based on what you did to them? Can you really decide how they would feel? 
Now this just blew my mind, totally. If you bought your wife a diamond ring, can you control how she would feel? The design might not be her taste. She might think it's too expensive and would rather not wasting the money in the house. She might thank you, but that's something you can't control. That's not your issue. What you need to do is focus on your own issue. Do what you want and don't care about what you can't control. That's the starting point, but what's the goal? Adler's theory is saying that it's to build a community feeling. What in the world is this? To simply put it, it's to feel like you're contributing to the people around you. If you think about it, this makes sense. When you feel like you're adding value in your job, isn't that a wonderful feeling? If you post a message or video on social media and someone says they were able to change their life, isn't that a great feeling? That's happiness and based on Adler's theory, that's the only happiness in life. Really? Here comes the prohibited rule number three. Don't compete. The key word is friends. When you compete with your friends or colleagues, they turn into enemies. The person who has more subscribers, the person who has better scores. No, no, the idea of always comparing and being better than someone else is fundamentally wrong. Why? The mentor says, are you always afraid of trying to be better than someone else? Is that the only way you can prove your own value? Well, don't we tend to think that if we don't win, we're losers? You don't have to define your value by how many games you win or lose. First, accept who you are. This doesn't mean to have a high self-esteem. Self-esteem is to try to raise who you hate to who you love and confident. You don't have to tell yourself and pretend that I'm pretty or I'm handsome. Accepting who you are no matter where you are is the very first step. Accepting who you are is not because you're working hard or you've accomplished great things or doing something good for your family. Just because you're earning money or going to the gym and staying fit shouldn't be the reason. Those actions that you take shouldn't be the reason why you accept yourself. If you stop doing those actions, you'll feel like a loser. You accept yourself because of who you are, your existence. Not because you have social status or a house or a big car. Just by being here on this earth. Accepting who you are is enough. The next step is to trust others. Not necessary to give them credit. When you go to the bank and you want to receive a loan, you need credit. You need certain conditions like a house or a job to have credit to borrow that money. Trust is something unconditional. The mentor is saying trust others without any conditions. Then the boy says, I could never do that. What if I get betrayed? Don't you think the same? The boy says it for us. The mentor says, if you trust others, is it your job to decide whether you betray or not? Is that your issue? but they will at least get the feeling if you're really trusting them or not, right? If you don't know whether they will betray you or not, why don't you trust them first and see how it goes? Trusting others first is important. Whether others will betray you or not isn't your issue. Once you've come this far, you can move on to the final step, which is to contribute to others. The mentor says, the only happiness in life is to contribute to others. And then the boy says, I can't believe that. I want to be a famous entrepreneur and become rich. Is the only happiness in life really just to contribute to others? The mentor would say calm down. All of that you mentioned just now is a way to contribute to others. Have you ever thought about what those people who have reached that kind of success thinks? Why do the wealthiest people on this earth keep on working? They just want to contribute to others. They just want to contribute to the others in the community they love. Are you thinking that life is just a straight line from where you are now and the goal you're going after? And are you thinking miserable because you haven't reached that point yet? That's not what life is all about. Nobody knows when life will end. But every dot, every moment that a person feels that they're feeling that they're contributing to the community, they've already reached that goal in that moment. Life is already perfect and complete in every single moment. The moment you understand this Adler's theory, you're already happy. The boy says, am I already happy because I've learned this theory? Wait a second, I can't still believe this. Isn't that too easy? The mentor says, life is that simple. Again, don't think life as a straight line. If you think like that, life will always be hard. Why is going on a trip to Egypt fun? Is it fun the exact moment when you reach your goal of seeing the pyramid? No, it's because you're enjoying each moment of walking in the desert, seeing the landscape around you, drinking water, talking with people around you, taking pictures, right? 
Life is exactly the same. Think that you're already happy. Focus on the presence, the dots. The boy says, but that's just an ordinary life. The mentor says, yes, all of what I said is to have the courage to live an ordinary life. Live in an ordinary life, accepting yourself, trusting others, contributing to others, and feeling happiness. Now, let me ask you again, is there anything wrong with that? This book was so interesting. If you like this kind of book summary, I think you will like the video over here. And if you're new here, hi, my name is Joey, and this channel is about self-development tips to change your mindset and change your life. So if this sounds good to you, please consider subscribing and hit that notification bell. If you also like this video, please give it a thumbs up, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.